Chaitanya Ubukananda Sri Advaita Gana Karam Sri Vasa Igor Bhakti Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare So we're continuing our series on the overview of the Bhagavad Gita. We've completed five chapters which are more or less in the karma in the area of karma yoga detached action now we're going to continue with that theme at least in the very beginning of this chapter and um, so you'll see this uh, chapter is called dhyana dhyana means meditation you can see here we have the typical yogi <clears throat> this is one of the caricatures that come up in iskan all the time as a the ideal uh what we say uh um, Astanga Yogi <laughs> is in the Himala, Himala, Himalayas. <laughs> okay. Go to the next slide. <laughs> okay. She see Radha Govinda. Okay. So here's this is a breakdown of the previous chapter, just to give an overview. Um, we've taken the different verses. And, uh, so we end it and go back to the previous slide. <laughs> and in the, lag, the, the last uh, sections, uh, 527 through 29, is liberation through Astanga Yoga. You'll see that'll come up in this chapter also. And peace on the platform of liberation. Then Krishna ends the, the chapter or the discussion in that section by saying, that uh, there are three principles by which peace is established, that he is the proprietor, he is the controller, and he is the enjoyer, and he is also the best friend. So one who knows that <laughs> lives free from anxiety because knowing Krishna as the only enjoyer, and the Bhaktaram, and proprietor, he owns everything. Because he owns everything, everything is meant for his enjoyment. And therefore, he is the supreme bhokta or the ultimate enjoyer for the purpose for which all enjoyment is directed towards Krishna. And he's the best friend of all living entities. And so best friend means he has the interests of his devotees or those who worship him as his main uh, concern. Okay, so we go on to the next chapter. The next section gives you a breakdown of the... These are the different sections as broken down in that chapter here. You'll see detached to work. The yoga Rudra stage is the perfectional stage. A stage of practicing yoga, controlling the mind. Um, what happens when a yogi fails? What Where does he go, even though he tries? And then it ends with what is the perfection of yoga. Okay. So here is the first Astanga Yoga. It's called also called Nishkarma Yoga. Engaging in detached work. The verse is, um, Krishna says, one who is unattached to the fruits of work. And who will work as he is obliged is in a renounced sort of life. He's a true mystic. He lights no fire. And he performs no duty. Although he works, he is not creating any uh, karmic results. <laughs> Nishkarma. Here we can see, see the different... Uh, you see the super soul. You see the jiva. And you see how the jiva is controlled by the living by the supreme lord or by the three modes of material nature so we can accept control either under the control of the supreme lord or under the control of the material energy in other words no one can do anything separately we're either working under the control of the material energy or the spiritual energy when we work under control of the material energy we are controlled by three different types of ropes those are called ignorance, passion, and goodness. Each of the ropes have a certain type of binding force that keeps one locked into the idea that material activities are the goal of one's uh, success in life. 
Here, but one who takes shelter of the Lord and works in a detached way, who probably giving all the results to the Lord, he's free. <laughs> Next uh, slide. One who purifies his vision by activities in this karma can by meditating on the super soul. So we talk about meditation here. One can develop devotion to him in yoga. Well, this is this is somewhat of a summary of the previous last ch uh, chapter. He's a supreme enjoyer, ultimate control, and he is the best friend. So one should meditate on him as the goal of yoga. <laughs> And here's, and these are just the different uh, connections between the two chapters. Super soul, consciousness increase, jnana yoga, one becomes attached to the body. And as one becomes detached from the body, one's knowledge increases automatically. Detachment also brings knowledge. It doesn't bring bhakti. Bhakti comes by way of following the, the guide, the, the path of bhakti, as will be explained in this chapter. <clears throat> in the first two verses you have, you have here, and this is the one who is, we mentioned this, one who is unattached to the fruits of his work, who works as he is obliged, is in the round outs. In other words, one should do their duty. He is a true mystic. I mean, when he perform, he lights no fire and performs no duty. In other words, he he's not acting on the material platform, although he is working. Therefore, he creates no karmic results. This is called mishkan, or without karma, karmic results. So renunciation is the same as yoga in the sense that it, by renouncing one thing, when one takes up something else. You know, here you see the bhakti yogi and the astanga yogi. One gives up the fruit, controls the senses, focuses his mind within. The bhakti yogi it becomes attached to Krishna. And control. So Krishna is making these apparent comparisons between the different types of yogas here. Stanga yoga is also a bona fide process, but bhakti yoga is the recommended process, especially in this age of Kali. Stanga yoga, we'll get into that later in the same chapter, is actually um, was recommended in the uh, Satya Yuga. You know, not in this particular yoga, because no one can perform the, the austerities that are necessary to perform Astanga yoga. And you'll get, you'll go down to the page, go down to the next verse. <clears throat> so one who is just beginning to, you know, who is in the work is said to be the means. Well, one who is already elevated in the yoga, cessation of material activities is said. So in the beginning, one practices detachment and renunciation and also um, cultivates knowledge. But as one gets situated in the process through detachment and cultivation of knowledge, then one's activities are, are, all, are situated in the process of yoga or connection with the Supreme through performing various activities. The renunciation is there as needed in the very beginning, but as one gets involved with the process, there's no need to renounce renunciation because the process includes renunciation within it. Just like in our Krishna consciousness. When we start, we 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 say, well, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, like that. We have to, that's the foundation for getting a foothold in devotional service. But as one engages in devotional service, one automatically performs activities for the pleasure of the Supreme, and therefore one becomes detached from all other activities. And therefore one commits no sinful activities because all activities are, are directed towards the service of the Supreme Lord. So 
renunciation is already included within bhakti. Here you see the different stages here, karma yoga, nishkarma yoga, jnana yoga, stanga yoga, and ultimately bhakti yoga. This is called the yoga ladder. This chapter is sometimes called the yoga ladder. The different stages of yoga as it goes through the different types of yoga. First, karma, kanda, Buddha work, rituals, wanting to go to the heavenly planets. You'll find that people actually come. Do you see them? They come to our temples. And they're, they're not interested in, in, uh, in serving the Lord. They're interested in getting some material benefits by performing various types of rituals, which will give them more sense gratification and ultimately elevate them at the time of death to the heavenly planets. But as Krishna explains, Shinya Punya Marcha Loka, that after the heavenly planets are also um, temporary, and one has to fall down back down to the material world again and begin all over again. Sometimes one falls even farther than they were before they started previously. So it's not uh, for devotees, these things are not. Next one is renouncing the fruits of activity. Um, I, I might like to make money. Okay, so I can make money and I'll give some of the money to uh, uh, to help you know propagate Krishna consciousness. I like to play music, so I'll play music for Krishna. This is karma yoga. Karma yoga means you do what you like to do within the realm of acceptable activities and you offer the fruits to Krishna. That's all. Bhakti is different. Bhakti me, and you'll see the difference between karma. It looks the same. Both are performing activities for the Supreme and both are renouncing the fruits. But one is doing what they like and offering it. And bhakti means to follow the instructions given by the spiritual master and follow that principle. Bhakti means to be obedient to what the Lord wants in the beginning, Krishna allows for uh, for someone to do what they want and offer the fruits. We find that even in our Krishna conscious society, their devotees are still in the karma yoga mood. They want to serve in a certain way, and that's and they if they don't get a chance to serve in the way they want to serve, they don't serve. <laughs> that's karma yoga. <laughs> okay, then a little higher is uh, jnana yoga. Renouncing the speculative knowledge, austerity, like that. More on the mental platform. Or on the, actually on the intellectual platform. Higher than that is renouncing fruit of the Ashtanga Yoga. That's the Eightfold Path. And of course, the highest is Bhakti. Next slide. A yogi may give up when his mental control reaches the stage of regarding well wishes, the envious, the pious, and sinful. <laughs> so he then he stops performing that karma, that yoga, which is trying to get material results. When he in his mind is controlled, so in these uh, verses from six five to six nine, uh, Krishna speaks a lot about the mind. And you can go on to the next one. This is called Yoga Rudrasya. Work on working with the mind. Uh, he must work because he's detached, pure in advance. Does not act for sense gratification. Doesn't act for food of activity. Has renounced all material duties. Permitted to quit prescribed duties. He can give up this karma yoga, practice yoga. He has full knowledge. He is cultivating detachment from residual results. Okay. So in those verses really talk about how the mind should be directed towards the yoga system. One should elevate, and you can see, you'll go to the next slide. There is a sort of a caricature. One, the one who delivered himself by the mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy at well. So we're sitting right next to our best friend and enemy, the mind. 
The mind can take you to hell, or the, as it says, you can see it here, or the mind can deliver you from the clutches of material entanglement. Here you see a nice caricature. There's the mind. One's the friend, the other one's the enemy. Same mind. <laughs> Sometimes we say <clears throat> that um, there's only one enemy, the mind. <laughs> when Prahlad Maharaj was uh, speaking to his father, his father was chastising him. He said, you were, you're siding with my enemy. And Prahlad Maharaj responded, and my dear father, your only enemy is your own mind. <laughs> so yeah, the mind is the friend and the mind is the enemy. So conquering the mind makes the mind a friend. That means gauging the mind towards devotion. And one who fails to do that, the mind will take them anywhere in the universe and cause one to act and think in ways that one doesn't even want to do due to the restless mind. So the big, very beginning principle of bhakti actually is here. One has to conquer that restless mind and direct it towards the goal, actually. And then the next verse tells you what are the symptoms of a controlled mind. Yeah, one who has controlled the mind, super soul is reached, he has to attain tranquility. To such a man, happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor and dishonor are all the same. Now, that sounds quite difficult to understand. How can honor and dishonor, heat and cold, everything? Because one who's controlled the mind and fixes the mind on the supreme, there's no dualities anymore. Dualities are part of the material energy. And one sees the dualities simply as part of the material energy. And therefore, they are not disturbed by or influenced by the dualities. And that leads to the next verse, when one becomes satisfied through them by engaging the mind in towards the Supreme Lord, the Super Soul, as it says here, he sees everything. Uh, pebble, stone, and gold is the same. In other words, he's not looking for anything in the material world, so everything in the material world seems to be of the same nature, uh, that of the something that has nothing to do with that person. It's not interesting. Here, we go to the next verse. The person is considered still further advanced when he regards honest well-wishers, affectionate benefactors, the neutral, mediators, the envious, friends and enemies, the pious and all and the sinners, all with an equal mind. Hmm. Uh, that requires uh, very strong mind control because the, 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 the yogi who is practicing has nothing, no interest of anything in this material world. So therefore he can see various types of persons in the same way because he doesn't have a, any relationship with anything in the material world. And for him, they're all the same on the absolute platform. He, he sees them here, the six enemies of the mind, kama, lust, krodha, anger, loba, greed, mada, illusion or intoxication, madness, mohan, illusion, I'm sorry, mohan is illusion, mada is intoxication, and Matsarya is envy. Uh, Srila Prabhupada describes that one can dovetail all of five of them except the last one, Matsarya, envy. Envy cannot be dovetailed, can only be uh, given up. And it has to be given up. That's the most strongest. And it's the feature by which the living entity comes to the material world because the living entity develops com a competitive nature with Krishna that competitive nature forces him to come to the material world and try to be Krishna himself in the material world. <laughs> he he get he finds his uh, he finds his uh, Radharani and then he thinks he's Krishna. You know, so that is the material world. <laughs> okay, one's established in self realization by virtue of knowledge of self realization. Again, same same thing. This is just the illustration of the previous verse. 
more advanced. It's another illustration of that of the of that verse. This is all about giving up work. This is about giving up work and focusing on, you know, seeing things equal. Now we go into the next section, further stages of the practice of yoga. And now you get into the Astanga Yoga, you see, the cessation of work. And you can see the different levels of Astanga Yoga, Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and uh, Samadhi, like that. These are the different stages of uh, Astanga Yoga. But Krishna brings this out. He does for a reason. Okay, next one. And then these are the different types of today's modern yogis <laughs> for physical and mental health, uh, to increase the quality of one's pregnancy, uh, chair dancing. I don't know what that actually is. <laughs> yoga for, it's like yoga for your animals and this stuff. So these are different caricatures of different types of yogas that people have concocted. Yoga is not a concoction. It is the means by yoga means to link up with the Supreme and not for any other purpose. Okay, get some of these yogis here. Like that. Have any of you tried any of these? <laughs> This one's a tough one here, burying your head in the sand. This is this has become very popular nowadays. It's called beer yoga. They have these clubs where they give you a beer and you do yoga exercise while you drink beer at the same time. This is really a, a farce. It's it's some it's someone's idea in order to to make some kind of variety, in order to attract people to make more and more money. If you do something new, people think it's something better, and then they try it. So um, it's just bogus. So here are the, again, these are the different uh, stages and what they mean. Pranayama, breath control, posture, internal disciplines, external disciplines, uh, withdrawal of the senses, concentration, meditation, absorption. And ultimately, union or integration with the Supreme. As Asta means eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we see the same thing displayed as a wheel. <laughs> Here's our friend again. <laughs> so, this is the principles by which Astanga Yoga is practiced living alone eating very frugally, yes, kusa grass, uh, keeping deer skin, sitting on deer skin, keeping the head erect, body straight, uh, mind completely focused on, on the tip of the nose, stopping the breath incoming and outcoming through the pranayama system. And then going to a secluded place away from everything, mental disciplines. And then uh, gradually, gradually, one brings the mind into the heart and one can meditate on the, on the, the soul, the uh, super soul within the heart. And the results are that one who, has, who can perfect the Sangha Yoga, it says here, one is never shaken in the midst of the gravest difficulties, freedom from all miseries arising from material contact. That also applies to bhakti yoga, but it's directed here towards the astanga yoga. The astanga yoga is a bona fide system, but in this age, manda sumanda mateo mandi bhaga upadrutaha, people in this age cannot perform these austerities, nor can they go away from their work and live in a secluded mountain, mountainous area all alone with giving up practically everything. It's not possible. There's only a few yogis who can possibly do it. There are yogis today who are doing that in different places within the Himalayas. They're there. But they are 
but it's not recommended in this age because a little deviation in the process and the whole process becomes null and void. So no one can perform it in this age. So you hear in the different yogis, karma yoga leads to jnana, on the next step is then astanga yoga, which we just described. Now the higher right, bhakti is the highest of all yoga, and that'll be explained as we go down the page. So now Krishna gives you some little personal that one who eats too much, eats too little, sleeps too much, or does not sleep enough, cannot pick time the yoga system. So one has to regulate their bodily needs. That is required. And then, of course, gradually, step by step, one becomes fixed and trained by using intelligence. And so, all of this is still within the category of the Astanga Yoga system. Mm -hmm. But you still have to deal with the monkey mind. So Krishna says, from whatever the actually from whatever the mind wanders, due to its flickering upstate, one would certainly bring it back under the control of the self. So this is something we have to do every day and every minute. Wherever your mind wanders, bring it back under the control of something spiritual. In other words, remember Krishna, remember the holy name, connect your mind with some activity of devotion. Because if the mind is not is not engaged, it will go wherever it wants to go. And usually it goes to some time, type of enjoyment. Where the mind is always thinking how to engage the senses and the intelligence in some kind of enjoyment. Unless the mind is very carefully controlled, which is difficult in this age. Of course, the best way to control the mind is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and focus on the instructions of the spiritual master. These are re recommended remedies for success in mind control. You can only be successful when you focus that mind on something that is outside of the three modes of material nature, and that is bhakti yoga. Many of these other act yogas still contain certain elements within the mode of goodness. And so the mode of goodness can always be challenged by the mode of ignorance and passion. And one will lose mind control very easily. We have the example of, of Vishwamita Muni, how he was performing severe austerities, controlling the mind, sitting in water in the, in the middle of winter, ice cold water up to his neck and meditating. And then in the, in the summer, sitting in the middle with seven fires surrounding him. And, the hot sun above, and he was meditating. And then Indra decided to break his meditation, so he sent uh, he sent a society girl. What was her name? Uh, I forgot her name. Anyway, uh, she came. And Menika, Guru Maharaj. No, Menika? Yeah, yeah, Menika. And she was just you know, making the sounds of her ankle bells as she was, and that broke his meditation. He actually became quite uh, disturbed, and then he became attracted to this society girl, wound up getting married, and that's the famous story of Sukuntala. Sukuntala is an epic that is known throughout India. The story of the life of Sukuntala was the, it was the issue between Menika and uh, Vishwamitra Muni, but he went back. He gave, after some time, he left everything, went back to his meditation. Indra sent another society girl named Ram. She came. This time he was determined not to become broken by any distraction. But when she came, he became angry. And, he, and due to the power of his yoga, he, he shot fire from between his eyes. And he burned her to ashes. He turned her into a, you know, a crisp pakora, just burnt to pieces. And... Uh, and then as soon as he did that, he fell down from his yoga. Because attachment and aversion 
are also two sides of attachment. So, therefore, one has to control the mind and bring it up to outside of the three realms of three modes of material. Life. That means to the spiritual platform or the bhakti yoga. Yeah. So now Krishna starts to get in. Those the yogi whose mind is fixed on me verily attains the highest perfection of transcendental happiness. He is beyond the mode of passion. He realizes qualitative identity with the Supreme, and thus he is free from all reactions of passion, simply by focusing the mind steadily on the Supreme Lord. And then the next verse, Krishna emphasizes the same principle, becomes free from all material contamination, achieves the highest stage of perfect happiness, and is in transcendental loving service of the Lord. So Krishna is getting into the elements of bhakti now. And then he goes back to say, and the yogi sees me everywhere and everyone in me. Indeed, a self-realized person sees me everywhere. This is the result of perfect meditation on the Supreme. And this is a, just an illustration of the same thing. Using the example of an eye, you see that that, that eye sees only Krishna. <laughs> when he looks, he sees Krishna everywhere. And then it talks again, and then again, of course, back to meditation on the super soul. To know that I and the super soul are one and the same. There's no difference. It's a different feature of the Supreme Lord and the super soul. The Lord in his Bhagavan features is within uh, the, he is manifested within the hearts of the living entities as super soul. But he remains outside in his Bhagavan feature in the supreme in the supreme uh, realm of spiritual existence. Okay, here's a very interesting verse. He is a perfect yogi who, by comparison to his own self, sees the true equality of all living beings, both in their happiness and in their distress. This requires some explanation. What does it mean? The true quality of all the seas elves. Srila Prabhupada says here. He's aware that everyone's happiness and distress are the same because they are unpolitical. And the cause of it, therefore, he's also experiencing happiness and distress. So he sees others in the same way. Therefore, he sees each person just like him on his own self. The cause of happiness is knowing that Krishna is a supreme enjoyer. The cause of distress is to think I can enjoy separate from Krishna. This is a this actually is the inspiration for preaching, this particular verse. Yeah. He tries to relieve their happy their distress and give them happiness by giving them Krishna consciousness. <laughs> Next. And now, now Arjuna is saying, although, although control of the mind is undoubtedly a difficult problem, nevertheless, control of the mind is essential and obtainable only by constant practice and detachment. So that's Krishna. You go to the, there's some illustrations here that this, so here's one pointed in the mind. We, we use this same uh, image to show that one should be focused on the on the target and nothing else. That same image is there on the right. Here is Dronacharya with the five Pandavas teaching them archery. <laughs> this particular slide, I don't understand it. Do you understand it? Uh, so this is explaining that this is Arjun talking to 
Krishna about mind control and who is Arjun? Arjun is the one who is trained by Dronacharya. No, I mean the uh, next, the next and, one. And one of the Pandavas and Arjun is the one who fought with Lord Shiva. So he's not ordinary who's asking this question that uh, I cannot control my mind. So this is Arjun. Arjun is one of the Narnarayan incarnation with Krishna. So he, that's why he's fighting with Shiva there? <laughs> yes, Gurmaj. Pashupati, yes. Oh, okay. And all right. And he's, this is Nar Narayan incarnation where Arjun is Nar. So Arjun yeah. is not ordinary. Okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. but, but he's asking this question. Okay. So here, Arjuna, after hearing all of the instructions, he says, and this is important, that after we hear all of the instructions about how to execute yoga or devotional service, we should ask questions if there's anything that is uh, unclear or difficult to perform. So now he's saying the system of yoga, which you have summarized, appears impractical and unendurable to me for the mind is restless and unsteady. Mm -hmm. Next verse. And then he speaks this verse. Chanchala himana krishna pramati balavad dridam pasyaham nigraham manye vayuri iva karam. Famous verse. Translation. The mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, and very strong, O Krishna. And to subdue it, I think it's more difficult than controlling the wind. It's pretty much challenging Krishna's uh, instructions. I don't think I can do it. You're asking me to control the wind. <laughs> Krishna answers. Well, here's some of the caricatures that illustrate the power of the blowing wind. You want to uh, talk about that a little bit? We can say that the wind is one of the most powerful forces in creation. If the wind goes up to three hundred miles an hour, it can blow down buildings in the, in the cities. This is a small wind, just being illustrated here, but the wind is so powerful that cities can be destroyed simply by the power of, of the the wind. And so. Try to control the mind. Huh? Now Krishna gives the answer here. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Asam Sayam Mahabaho Mano Durni Gridam Chalam Abhyasena Tukuntaya Bhairagena Chagriyate. Here it says that uh, it's in Delhi very difficult to control the restless mind, but it is possible. Krishna is saying it's possible by suitable practice and by detachment, that by following the yoga system, that's the suitable process, and by giving up the desire for uh, food of work in the material world. And that we heard from the previous verses, the importance of detaching oneself from material activities. So when you want to control the mind, this is, needs some explanation. You practice the yoga system, but if you're still looking towards the material for some kind of satisfaction or some kind of gain, you won't be able to control the mind. It's not possible. The mind has to be, as we see it sold, those pictures, has to be one-pointed towards the Supreme Lord in devotion. It can't be all over the place and expect to control it. It's not possible. And then Krishna says, for one whose mind is unbridled, self-realization is difficult work. He's making it sound easy. But he whose mind is controlled and who strives by appropriate means is short of success. Since self-realization is difficult work, it's actually impossible work, but he says difficult. So here he gives the formula. 
strive by right means, by appropriate means, okay? Here, this one is very important for us. Trying to practice yoga while engaging the mind in material enjoyment is like trying to ignite a fire while pouring water on it. Similar yoga practice without mental control is simply a waste of time. That's it. Okay. Now, after we explain it, then we go into another category of discussion, the destination of an unsuccessful yogi. Unsuccessful transit either attain heavenly enjoyment, good birth, and the birth in a wise transcendental family. And uh, they have they get a chance to begin in their next life from where they left off. Nothing is lost. But Arjuna is not so much so convinced about this yet. So he's going to ask questions, obviously. Here is what happens to the unsuccessful trend? He begins and later he falls through the worldly mindless. Does he not attain perfection? This is a very interesting. Uh, does not does not such a man who is bewildered from the path of trans fall away from both spiritual and material success and is perish like a ribbon cloud with no position in any sphere? Ribbon cloud means a cloud driven by the wind. So what does that mean? That okay, we practicing spiritual life, but somehow I fall, and now I'm nowhere. I gave up material life. And I can't be happy or a successful in spiritual life. I'm lost. I'm in no position. That's Arjuna in saying that. And then he said, this is my doubt. Please dispel this doubt for me. And Krishna says, he says, a transcendental and engaged in something activities, I can't see the word. Does not meet with destruction. Auspicious. Uh, uh, auspicious activities does not meet with destruction either in this world or in the spiritual world. One who does good, my friend, is never overcome by evil. So nothing is lost. There's a verse in the uh, Bhagavatam which explains that even if one becomes very successful in their material activities and achieves all kinds of benefits from it, what is the gain? And what is the loss to one who takes up spiritual life but somehow desists due to worldliness? What is the loss? So material life is lost at the time of death. Everything is lost, or even sometimes before then. But spiritual life, that is never lost. Even if one fails to finish, become perfect, still they pick up where they left off in their last life. Prabhupada said it's like money in the bank. <laughs> and here you have the example of Ajamil. Ajamil, he, you know, he was a devotee, at least in a very pious way in the very beginning of his life, but he gave it all up. And somehow or other, he chanted the name of Narayan, calling his son. And due to his pious activities, he remembered Narayan when he called. Therefore, he was saved from the Anadudas. So what this point is very important to understand for us, that even a little advancement on this path, one is never, one is in a good position. Of course, we want to finish. We want to become pure devotees. We want to go back to Godhead. That's the goal. But nothing is lost, even if one does not finish. They get a chance and then they come. Suchina, I think we'll get to that verse. It'll come up. Yeah, by birth in the good family, you know, naturally attracted to yoga. And he may go to the heavenly planets, enjoy 
for a while and then come to the pious, to the pious living entities and take birth in an aristocratic or very righteous family. Such a birth is rare in this world. Prabhupada talks about that a lot in terms of the children that are born in our movement. Many of them were yogis, devotees in their previous lives, or even came from the heavenly planets. Now they took birth in Krishna. And you see the children born in our movement are advanced. You can see it all right from birth. You see they have their, they're much more aware, much more intelligent. They are actually uh, carrying from their last life their previous some stars. And then one can make further progress and ultimately achieve the goal. Suchinam Simatam Deheg Yoga Brasta Pajayate. These are different illustrations. You see the kids. You see kids in our movement are like that. There's one kid in our movement, he, he can recite the whole Bhagavad Gita. He's <laughs> like a little kid. <laughs> okay, this is being illustrated here. Again, the uh, so an unsuccessful yogi uh, gets a chance to try again in the next life in a good situation. Where materialists, very successful, may, may take a birth as a pig or some birth in the hellish regions because of his success in material life as he commits so many sinful activities. The yogis are greater than the materialists, the imperialists, food workers, and the ascetics. And here's the last verse. Those who have full faith always think of Krishna. Yoginam apisar vesham madgate natmanaham stradavan bhajate yomante me yuktatamo mataha. Of all yogis, those who have full faith always think of Krishna and render transcendental loving service to him. They are the best of all yogis. They are the highest. They are the bhakti yogis. Greater than you. So here again, there's the verse. Hmm. Yeah. It's being illustrated again by these different photos here. Again, and then ultimately the destination is the spiritual world. <laughs> playing with Krishna as his friend and enjoying unlimitedly in the association with Krishna. Her life is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. So don't ever give up bhakti, no matter how difficult it is, because if you stay with the process, you will succeed. Even if you find it difficult or even impossible, continue, try to work with it and stay in the practice. And eventually, you will achieve perfection, either in this verse or in another verse. Once you begin the path, if you stay on the path, you're guaranteed to reach the goal. And so here's the breakdown of the chapters again, the different categories, which we explained. Okay, we can stop here. Mm -hmm. And we can open it up for the questions. Hare Krishna Garmash, thank you so much uh, for such a wonderful class. Um, I just want to um, do the poll questions, uh, quiz questions, two questions we have. Yeah. This is a very important chapter. Very important chapter. See, it's the springboard for the rest of the Bhagavad Gita, actually. Yes. So, dear devotees, um, uh, I'm going to launch the quiz now. It's question one. What is Krishna's instruction on controlling the mind? 
by constant practice and detachment from activities not devoted to the Lord, meditating on light, indulge in sensual pleasures by performing yoga for mental health. I request everyone to participate. Mm -hmm. I think you're giving the answers before. No, I'm just reading the choices. But you're illustrating the actual answer. <laughs> and I'll keep quiet. <laughs> right. 18 out of 30. Um, Seshni Mataji, I think um, if you're on the mobile, you can uh, slide your screen so that you can see the poll. Okay, somebody said by performing yoga for mental health. <laughs> One seventeen out of eighteen. Okay. Yeah, the first one is the actual answer. <laughs> Seventeen. Eighteen out of thirty participated, and uh, yeah, the correct answer is the first one. Thank you. Thirty-two. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'll go back to the second question. Uh, okay. You know, sometimes this, uh, one second. Oh, I don't get a chance to participate, okay. <laughs> um, I don't know why this is not allowing um, to share. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I know, got it. Yeah, this is this question too. Who can perform yoga among the following? There are four choices and uh, thank you. 15, 16, 17, 18 out of 30, 20. Yes, 21 out of 30. Be nice if everybody yeah. participates. Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. 22 out of 31. Mm -hmm. The host and co host can't participate, but remaining all can participate. 24 out of 30, great. And I can't participate either. Mm -hmm. Yes, good news. 25 out of 30. So everyone is um, participating for the second question <laughs> rather than the first question every time since so four days I'm watching. Mm -hmm. Good, very good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So 25 out of 30, yeah, everyone got it right. Uh, I, I think so, we'll see the result. Yeah, one who is regulated in the habits of eating, sleeping, and recreation. Thank you, everyone. So if you have any questions or comments, um, you can please go ahead now. You can raise your hand. Badra Mataji, you want to ask anything? You are... Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj. Please. Uh, just wanted to um, say thank you for really wonderful class and uh, uh, basically first question I was a little bit confused about uh, it was saying not devoted to the Lord is it right the first option answer um, were you referring to the questions that were given? Yeah. What does it say? Mm -hmm. I think the option, first option was... Uh, well, some of the answers are wrong. There's one right answer among the four answers. I'll share it. Are you able to see the screen again? Yeah, yeah it yeah. says... 
by yeah, constant but... practice and detachment from activities and not devoted to the law. Okay. Practice and detachment from, okay, no, I was reading it wrong. It was my mistake. Sorry about that. Hare Krishna. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Namrat Mataji, you have a question? Please go ahead. Hare Krishna, my humble obeisances of glories to Shri Prabhupada. So in 6.35, uh, Krishna mentions that uh, um, mind is possible to control by suitable practices and detachment. So here when he says that striving by appropriate means, so uh, can you little elaborate on the appropriate means what he's saying? As given by the as, as given by the process itself, or you might to, to be more uh, direct, the instructions of the spiritual master. <laughs> that is the appropriate means. The bhakti is described in in a general way, and it's also described in a specific way. Both. Are them are the appropriate means is a general sense, and then there's uh, so for instance, one should uh, one should eat, but one should eat only prasadam. That's appropriate. One should uh, one should perform activities. One should perform only activities for the pleasure of the Lord. That's appropriate. So it's not that you do the activity, it doesn't matter. You have to know what is the, uh, how that active, that instruction guides you towards the process of bhakti. And therefore you have the spiritual master. So uh, guidance comes in three forms. Comes in Shastra, comes in Guru, and it comes in Krishna. These are the three ways of Actually, scripture is not different than Krishna, and Guru uh, teaches on behalf of scripture. He doesn't create any anything new. So appropriate means by the direction of higher authority. <laughs> thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Not that we can do anything we want and call it bhakti. <laughs> well, just like for instance, uh, I, I'm very, I'm using I'm just using an example. A person is thinking I I'm very magnanimous. Today I'm going to take some breadcrumbs that I offer to my deity and serve and feed the pigeons. I know I'm supposed to go to the temple and do puja, but still. I think it's more beneficial I go out and feed the pigeons. So that's not appropriate means. That means that you do whatever you want. When you're given a prescribed duty and you don't follow it and you want to do something that looks like bhakti also, but it's not, it falls more into the category of karma. So one has to adhere to the Guidance of higher authority, and not act whimsically. One may also, I mean, to get to take this same principle, one may also think of different ways to serve, but that should be in addition to what is given and not in replacing what is given. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mataji. Raj Prabhu, please go ahead. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All oh, glories to Srila Prabhupada. All oh, glories to you, Maharaj. All oh, glories to all of the devotees. Maharaj, it seems that uh, we have this like gradual progression in bhakti because we have we may have strong, it may start off with many attachments. 
So we may be more under the control of Maya and then gradually become less under the control of, control of Maya as we progress in bhakti. And then there was a, a statement in the presentation that saying something like, when we're engaged in bhakti, then we're kindling, kindling the fire. But when we're engaged in, when we're engaged in uh, other activities, material activity, then we're, it's like pouring water on that fire. So how does that work? Because in the beginning, we will, we will all be mixed devotees and we will be engaging in bhakti, but at some points we will be engaged yeah. in material activities because we're not fully detached from them all yet. Yeah, that's true. Therefore, as one practices, one learns the science of bhakti. And the principle that governs that is what is favorable for devotional service, anukulena, and what is unfavorable, pratikulena. So one has to know what is favorable. They're called nidhi, they call the vidis and nishedas. Nishedas means things to do, and vidis means things to avoid. So one has to actually learn through the process what to avoid and what to accept. <laughs> and that requires instructions, questions from the spiritual master if you're not sure, or if you read it and you're not sure how it applies to you, and then you also ask questions. But... Uh, um one of the things is that he says what is what causes a man to act against his will even though he knows it's wrong that was brought up in the third chapter it was lust and lust only so although we know something is still wrong or not beneficial for our devotional service we still like it and we do it anyway and that krishna describes that as being you know sense gratification or lusty desires so one has to restrain themselves from that and engage in devotion so restraint is not the process restraint is part of the process the process is to re-engage that same uh, intelligence words abilities time energy facilities in krishna service Bhakti is practical. You do the same thing sometimes you would do in the material world, but you do it for Krishna. That is called bhakti. Well, that's karma yoga. Actually, when you that's karma yoga. But when you do bhakti, you, you follow the instructions of the spiritual master and work according to them. So it's easy. You learn. What's favorable, what's unfavorable, what's material, what's spiritual, what's beneficial, what will take you in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just like to glorify a devotee is, is favorable. To find fault and criticize a devotee is unfavorable. Now, is it that our efforts in following the instructions and uh, trying to perform bhakti, is it that efforts that is keeping the fire going even though there's still some water in it? Yeah. Or it, mm. The effort along with association. I just received a letter from someone who is explaining how they have, they're slipping in their devotional service. And they didn't, they couldn't understand why. And, and, I, and I explained to them, wrong association. If you have wrong association, or if you don't take right association, it becomes pretty, very difficult to practice bhakti. It's 
association is a foundational for all of the executions and, the, and devotional souls. As we gain, gain knowledge and uh, intelligence in association, we learn how to perform bhakti even outside of association. But that shouldn't be the beginning. You should always take association because association gives us inspiration, keeps us on the path, inspires us, gives us a chance for service. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sakshi, Sakshi please go. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Prabhupada, all glories to you, and all glories to the wonderful devotees out here. Uh, so Maharaj, my question is, uh, what happens to a person who is actually liking the Krishna conscious process, but uh, has a little or turbulent faith in Krishna or Acharyas, uh, because the mind is always reeling and assuming things. Um, and what uh, and will that person eventually develop Krishna consciousness of, for abiding in the process, or because of having little faith, they fall down? And uh, secondly, each passing day, how do we increase our faith? So that's my condition. So that's why I'm asking. In the uh, ninth chapter, verse number three of the, we'll come to that. It talks about the three levels of faith. First class, second class, and third class. <clears throat> and he explains what are the differences. One who has very little faith can be easily, uh, what we say, distracted from the process of devotional service. If they hear something that is uh, contrary, they may agree with that because they they don't have enough knowledge. Because knowledge and faith are somewhat similar, so develop the, the proper knowledge, and then as you practice devotional service, your your faith will also grow. So one has to come to at least the second class platform of faith. Hmm. The first class for, for means implicit faith, even without reasoning. Uh, second class platform means that even if I hear something contrary, I know I, it doesn't dis, doesn't disrail me or doesn't uh, deter me from my practice of Krishna consciousness. As may mention, and that uh, I would suggest anyone who wants to learn. More about the principle of faith. Read that verse 9 3 in the Bhagavad Gita. It's a very important verse. It's quite a lengthy purport, but Prabhupada explains different levels of faith. So, you know, a preliminary faith will keep you, it will get you to Krishna consciousness, but it won't keep you in. You have to increase that quality of faith through the process of doing devotional service and cultivating. A knowledge of the process. Of the dances, Mataji? But if you stay in association of devotees, you, you're pretty much somewhat shielded and protected from being de de deterred in your Krishna consciousness. It's when we go outside the association of devotees, then our faith is challenged. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji. Sayashni Mataji, you can go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, my humble obi, please accept my humble obeisances um, and all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you and all glories to all the devotees. Um, firstly, I just want to uh, read my comment that I made and then I will ask the questions. Uh, if I can just go into the comments. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Maharaj. This was such an important chapter and you explained it so well. I learned so much today. Thanks for this wonderful class. This chapter, I realized so much about the mind and what Krishna is explaining, how to control the mind, 
also for children and the importance of Krishna consciousness for them and for anyone who follows this path. You also explained nicely using the stories and examples, which was so much more helpful. Um, there was so much more learning than this and wisdom that you imparted um, from this today. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, I do have two questions, but the first one, um, so as you even said, um, Maharaj, from text um, chapter 634 and 35, you know, I feel like uh, Arjuna a lot of the times, and I'm sure a lot of people feel like that, where Arjuna is saying that the mind is restless, turbulent, and obstinate and very strong. But Krishna, as you said, he explains it, he says it so easily, how to control the mind with um as you've explained, suitable practice, detachment, following a yoga system, giving up um, the material work, and also, um, you know, following the master. So it isn't that easy, though, is it? And sorry, and chanting the Maha Mantra. I know with chanting the Maha Mantra, it does make a difference. I've seen that for myself and for everyone that I've been in contact with. But it isn't that simple. Yeah, well, Krishna gives that gives the word in there. He says constant practice. He doesn't yes. say he says constant practice. So you have so you have to practice continuously. And as you practice, we all know that if you want to be good at something, you have to practice it. So bhakti is like that. You have to practice the practice as it's given, and gradually you develop the qualities that are needed for success. Because those qualities are already there within the soul. The practice brings out the qualities. And when the qualities start to become uh, apparent, and then you start, you start acting on those qualities, which are actually spiritual qualities. So const that's why Krishna says, he doesn't say, he says constant practice. Or he's... Uh, the, the word has been changed, appropriate activity. Um, the original uh, text in the Bhagavad Gita says constant practice and detachment. But Where they, is that, um, Maharaj? In, in, in verse 635, the, the, the original uh, translation in the Bhagavad Gita is... Uh, possible by suitable practice and by detachment. Um, in the original translation of the Bhagavad Gita, since it was changed, they used the word constant. 635, yeah. When it changed the word suitable, constant to suitable. I guess it's synonymous. Yeah. It's yeah. The same thing. That practice which is appropriate. But it has Thank to be, you, Maharaj. It has to be constant. If it's not constant, it's, it won't develop. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. That helps me a lot when you said constant practice. And I think that's that's very helpful for, for a lot of people as well. The second thing, Maharaj, you explained, if I have time, Srimati, uh, just um, you explained the story about the, the, the devotee or the person who had a son, Narayan. And um, just because of him chanting, saying his name, remembering him, he was obviously saved. And I've heard that story a few times, and even the other day, and apart from you hearing it today. So my question is, I haven't thought of this, and it doesn't bother me, but I just want to know, um, if does it matter how we've come into Krishna consciousness? I mean, you've explained in this um, chapter beautifully, you know, with the young children and how if they come in, they've obviously been yogis before. But does it matter in relation to the story? Was it Puni who had a son, Narayan? So does it matter if you become in, if, so if someone has come in that way, does Krishna make a distinction? Or is it that just everyone who remembers Godhead at the time of death, that that they will obviously the process, be liberated? Yeah, the process is absolute for everyone. So no matter how you come, in the Bhagavatam it says, Kirata Hunam Palinda Pukasa, Sambira Yavana Kashagana. In that verse, it lists as people who are below the Vanashram system. They are considered to be uh, lower races within the material tabernacle. 
And even if they come to Krishna consciousness, they can attain perfection. So uh, Lord Chaitanya's movement is for everybody. Jagais, the Madais, anyone who takes the Krishna conscious can reach perfection if they follow the process carefully and continuously. Thank you, Maharaji. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you Mataji. Thank you, Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah, Manisha Mataji, you want to go ahead? Hi, Krishna. Manisha. Manisha Mataji, you are you have to unmute and uh... okay, let's go to Sinduri. Oh, yeah. Manisha Mataji. Uh, Hare Krishna. I'm audible. Yes, yes. No, we can't hear you, Mataji. Okay, so we'll go to Sinduri Mataji. Um, you can fix your audio, Mataji. And oh. Sorry, Hare we are not able to hear you. Um, Hare Krishna. Yeah, now we can hear you, Mataji. Can you can you start your question again? Yes, 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 Mataji. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All good, Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for such a nice class. Uh, Maharaj, uh, you told a story uh, that at the end of the life, <clears throat> that at the end, end of the life, uh, uh, he thinks when when he chanted the names of Narayan, he got the darshan of Narayan. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, but he had no motivation and was thinking about his, and he was thinking about his son. So, but we will, uh, like, uh, we will. Uh, when we chant, uh, just uh, we will go to God's abode just by chanting Krishna's name because at the time of chanting, sometimes we think about God, but most of the times I'm not thinking of God. So, can yeah. we go? You name your son Krishna and you start chanting Krishna's name, then you might be chant thinking of your son. <laughs> So, um, Krishna's name is absolute. In the case of Ajamil, it's quite interesting. You need to hear more on that. And this comes up in the discussion. It's also mentioned in other Shastras that he called loudly for his son, Narayan. But in the calling, when he heard himself call, the name, his son's name, he remembered Narayan the Supreme. That's not mentioned in the in the in the text there, but the Acharyas give that understanding. And of course, he, he chanted without offense, but still he didn't go back to Godhead. He became free from all of his sinful activity which saved him from going to hell. But he was then given the, op the chance to continue his life and he went to Hardwar. And for 12 years, he performed bhakti yoga in the holy land of Hardwar, in the Himalayas. And then he perfected his bhakti with Dr. Dagman. So when we're chanting, we should also understand that Krishna's name is Krishna. I, I'm calling Krishna. So you should understand the name is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And not just mindlessly chant. You have to chant with mindfulness, not mindlessness. Mindlessness means I'm just sounding the words. Mindfulness means I'm actually directing the sound of my chanting towards Krishna. <laughs> that's mindful chanting, and that's chanting. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, like uh, when we chant our rounds, so we will think about Krishna? I hope so. <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't think about what you're going to do later on in the day. Think about it. But if you hear the sound of his name, that is thinking about Krishna. So chanting means to hear. Chanting means to fall. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Krishna. Nice question. Uh, Sinduri Mataji, you want to go ahead next? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Danvat Pranams to all the devotees. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, Danvat Pranams to you. Uh, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. So my question to you, Maharaj, is um, so when we uh, chant the holy name, uh, when we do our chanting, our daily rounds, so I always try to tell my mind that this is the high priority uh, task. And uh, I always tell my mind that, um, you know, this is the most important time, <laughs> no matter what, even the earthquake comes, <laughs> this is the most important time. Still, my mind uh, wanders uh, somewhere or other, but gradually uh, I came to a state that now it is only thinking about the activities like, uh, you know, book distribution or some uh, prashadam service or some uh, other uh, uh, bhakti vriksha services and all that. But still, uh, it is also, uh, you know, it is also uh, not needed at that point of time because I'm chanting. So when I was chanting, I have to chant, right? Uh, so... How to, uh, should I ignore my mind or uh, should I continue uh, chanting or should I write the points and and then uh, continue chanting? Because um, uh, as you said, uh, uh, Abhyasa, I mean, as Krishna said, Abhyasa, Netu Kaunteya, Vairagya, So should, should, how should we constantly practice uh, you're specifically speaking about chanting, which is <clears throat> chanting means to hear. So you bring your you bring your attention to the sound of the, the name. That's all. Prabhupada said chanting is simple. Even if the mind goes somewhere else, keep it on the sound vibration, and that'll bring it back to the name. Keep it on the sound. Krishna says in the same chapter, whenever and wherever the mind wanders due to its unsteady and flickering nature, one should bring it back under the control of the self. I mean, bring it back to the sound vibration. That's all. It wanders, bring it back. So, uh, as you said, uh, Krishna, Krishna and Krishna's name are non-different. Both are same. So when we chant the holy name, uh, generally I close my eyes and I chant. So at that time, should we uh, meditate on Krishna's holy feet? No. You should, you should uh, just hear the sound of the name. If you, if you, if you, yeah, Prabhupada talks about that. He said, don't try to think of the form of Krishna while you're chanting. He said, if you're chanting nicely, the form will automatically appear in your mind. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. That's all. And I have one more question, Guru Maharaj. Uh, so, how to develop strong determination in Krishna consciousness? Because sometimes when we are in the association of devotees, uh, you know, uh, nothing comes into the mind. We just focus on only the our consciousness is so nice and pure, but when we come back to the uh, back to the material uh, activities and other duties, uh, you know, uh, it uh, diverts and it takes distraction and uh, diverts into some other things. But so, how to constantly uh, develop and engage in the uh, devotional service. Keep, keep chanting. 
Prate koro kaje muku bohori. Work with work work with your hands and chant with your mouth. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Done with pronouns. Thank you, Mataji. Nice questions. Scarlett Mataji, you want to go ahead? Hare Krishna, and thank you very much for today. Um, in in the verse 30, it says that uh, we should see every, uh, Lord Krishna in everything. I have very, very bad difficulty with that because when I see how some people behave, for instance, it was not very long ago, I saw uh, some young uh, boys, they drank and they threw the, the bottle to the car. And I, how can I see Krishna in that? That is, that is my difficulty. I have so much difficulty to see Krishna in everything. I can do it in some, but not in everything. How to do it? Thank you. When you know that nothing happens without the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. You may not see the form of Krishna, but you should understand that it's his, it's his material energy that's working. So you connect the energy with Krishna. Even though it's something different, still it's his energy. You're not going to be able to see Krishna personally in these things, but you're going to be able to see that here is the material energy working in a certain way. And that's what that energy is Krishna's energy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, devotees. Um, such a wonderful questions and a nice discussion. Um, you have any more last minute questions or comments, devotees? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the wonderful class and nice discussion. Um, I hope we'll see you all tomorrow again uh, with chapter seven. Um, class will be given by the Maharaj again. Thank you so much, devotees. Please join tomorrow again. Do you have another seven that you can send me? Okay, sure. Guruvaj, may I please ask you to repeat? I couldn't hear properly. This one you sent me today is really ideal. Do you have one like that for number seven also? Yes, Guruvaj. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, send that. I will email you. Okay. Thank you so much once again. Um, let's send the call here. One chakal patar vesha kripa send the pavacha patana pavane pio vesha vipio. Namon namon. Sri Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Sri La Prabhupada ki jai, Sri Nesandra Maliswam Maharaj ki jai. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much for today. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Srimati Mataji, and thank you.